Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn, and today we're getting enthusiastic about smushing words together. But first, our most recent bonus episode was about secret codes, ciphers, Hildegard von Bingen, cryptography, cryptic crosswords, and Morse code romance. And you can listen to it at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Also on Patreon, we have 80 plus other bonus episodes on things like swearing and linguistics in fiction and other behind the scenes things from Lingthusiasm. Bonus episodes are around the same length as main episodes, but we sometimes do slightly different things like a deep dive into a single academic paper or AMAs and updates on our other projects, and sometimes we get a little bit silly. We run on the direct support of our listeners, which means we don't have to run ads. So if you'd like to help us keep existing and making these free episodes for everyone, we'd really appreciate it if you'd consider becoming a patron. Or if you were a patron for a while and you had to leave for a bit, we'd also love to see you back. There are more bonus episodes for you to enjoy now. Gretchen, I have some words that are made up of two other words, and I'm going to make you guess what the other two words are that they're made up from. Okay, sounds fun. Our first word is motel. Ah, this one I know. This is a motor hotel. It is indeed, because you can drive your car all the way up to the door of your room. Absolutely. Uh, And I assume this was invented around when the car became popular, I guess. Yeah, I had thought that it was maybe like a mid-century thing in the 50s or 60s when cars really took off, but apparently the earliest citation is from 1925. Huh, that is earlier than I thought it was. Yeah. Okay, next word? Smog. Smog. Yes, this one I know from smoke and fog, right? It is indeed that disgusting, thick combination of smoke and fog. And that's from 1905, particularly disgusting winter in London. Also earlier than I expected. Mm Mm-hmm. Brunch. Brunch. Now that is definitely a modern word from breakfast and lunch. I do it all the time. An absolutely indispensable part of my vocabulary but it is from 1896. 1896! They were having brunch in 1896! I love it! Yeah, because it is a very useful concept. It is indeed. Okay, I'm feeling really good about these portmanteaus so far. Hit me with another one. Mizzle. Ooh, mizzle. I want to say that one's from Mist and Drizzle. It is, actually. Nice work. It's really giving me sort of Ms. Frizzle vibes. <laughs> <laughs> if Miss Frizzle wanted to be more efficient, she'd become Mizzle. Yeah. I have no idea how old that one is, because all of these have been much older than I was expecting. So maybe it dates to around smog. I don't know. No, this one is much more recent. Okay. It's one of those late 20th century, early 21st century, as part of this explosion of these kind of words. Uh, the next one is Fossil. Fossil. Uh, that's definitely a Muppet. <laughs> It does sound like a Muppet name, doesn't it? Something fuzzy. Yeah, okay. Uh, No, that's Fuzzy Bear. Okay. It's a fake nozzle. It's a (laughs) fuzzy nozzle. (laughs) Fuzzy nozzle is my final answer. Think of it in the context of mizzle. Oh, um, wait. Okay, so could it be fog and drizzle? It is indeed. Lots of uh, subtle gradations on weather apparently require more nuanced creation of new blend words. I have never heard anyone call it fossil. <laughs> Great, good. Uh, our final one is Brinkles. Brinkles. I want to say, you know, inspired by brunch, that's breakfast sprinkles. That does actually sound delicious. Uh, you guys have fairy bread in Australia. That's like sprinkles on bread. That could be breakfast sprinkles. Yeah? No? <gasps> Uh, the list that I took it from has it as bed wrinkles. Oh, no, 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 no. I, I, that's much less fun. I don't care about bed wrinkles at all. <laughs> I want some breakfast sprinkles. <laughs> I deliberately chose some very effective classics and some maybe not so effective failures, but we are living in this era of portmanteau word explosions. I guess an explosion goes outward and it's more like an implosion of two words coming together to create some new word. 
So there's a lot of different ways that words can get smushed together to use, you know, the very technical term of smushing. Mm -hmm. I want to say that, like, in some ways, smushing is not a technical term, but I have actually been to a linguistics workshop where people were talking about words like smushing into each other and glomming onto each other. Oh, glom. Mmm, glom. It's not that this is never used, actually. (laughs) Uh, Despite seeming a bit silly. But yeah, it's tempting when we're looking at like a dictionary style sense of words to think of them as these sort of atomic units that have these clear white spaces between them. But in practicality, words are often getting sort of smushed together, squished together, these very sort of visceral words. Yeah, I, it's a it's a little bit, uh, it sounds unpleasantly messy to my <laughs> mind, but I, I guess we'll stick with it. <laughs> Would you say it squicks you out for another it, one? It squicks me out a little bit, for sure. Okay. I find them very delightful. I think it's really vivid <laughs> and sort of, you know, like, slime that all the kids are into these days. And as we'll discover in this episode, incredibly useful. Words are constantly coming together, crashing into each other, smushing together as part of the process of how language grows and changes. Yeah, it's a really fun concept. And portmanteaus are one relatively vivid example of smushing because we're often still aware of breakfast and lunch or motor and hotel. And so you can see the connection for how they came to smush together very vividly. In this episode, we're going to look at two very different kinds of linguistic smushing and how bringing together sounds and meanings in different ways can affect the way that language is used and how it changes. We did ages ago an episode about several different kinds of linguistic nothings, Mm -hmm. about different ways that aspects of nothing or silence or absence of a thing can mean something. And those came from a whole bunch of different areas. So when we're talking about different kinds of linguistic smushing, that also seemed like a chance to talk about different types of linguistic phenomena that all have this thing in common with the words sort of glom onto each other. And we couldn't help but start with the portmanteau. Absolutely. The thing that fascinates me about portmanteaus is that, like, some of them really work. Uh Like, frenemy, that's great. Like, what a good and useful combination, which surprisingly dates back to 1891. I feel like it's one of those such satisfying combinations that I'd be unsurprised to discover people have coined it and coined it again. Yeah, because it's got this, like, great sense of dissonance. Uh, between frenemies. But yeah, the OED has it from 1891, even though it feels very modern, to like modern day Kennergy or Kenuff (laughs) from Ken in the Barbie movie. Like portmanteaus are still going, we're still coining them. English in particular seems particularly prone to them. I have encountered uh, some examples of portmanteaus in Spanish. Great. So if you're combining English and Spanish in the same sentence, some people might refer to that as Spanglish in English. Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm told you can also call it Espanglish in Spanish. Oh, that's very satisfying. <laughs> yes, very the, the satisfying. The portmanteau works in both languages so similarly. And I have also come across Amigovio, mm-hmm. which is from Amigo and Novio. So that's friend and like boyfriend or girlfriend to refer to, you know, some relationship that's got a few aspects of both, maybe friend with benefits type thing. Oh, Yeah. I do like how portmanteaus pop up when there's this really satisfying meaning that's carved out of the two words that come together. And they often do fill these cultural niches for some period of time. Yeah, exactly. So there's a really fun Wikipedia article for blend words, which is the more technical linguistic term for what's popularly known as a portmanteau that has lots of fun examples in various languages. And we're not just going to read a Wikipedia article to you, but if you want to go (laughs) click on that, you can. Um (laughs) I think blend really highlights how you're blending together the sounds at the end of one word and the beginning of another word, but you're also blending together the semantics of both of those words. Do you want to hear my favorite example of an absolutely like multi-step amazing blend in English? Sure. Okay. So do you know the word bro T3? Uh, I absolutely do not. Is that a robot? <laughs> This is not R2-D2's cousin. (laughs) My favorite Star Wars character, when people ask now, I'm going to say it's Bro T3. (laughs) This is a very sort of Tumblr in the 2010s word, I will say, which dates me. 
I think it's also good to point out that cultures can be the entirety of English when it comes to Motel or Tumblr in the 2010s when it comes to Bro T3. <laughs> so it starts with an acronym, which is OTP, which stands for One True Pairing. Okay, acronym, another classic 20th century obsession of English. Absolutely. So people who would say, oh, like, these two characters on this show or in this book or movie, I think they should get together. They're my one true pairing, mm -hmm. things like that. But then this takes on a sort of hyperbolic meaning. So it doesn't have to be like actual one pairing that I think is is the best. It can just be like, I think these two characters should get together. It would be interesting if they got together. Mm -hmm. And then people start saying, well, what if three characters got together? And so instead of an OTP, you had an OT3. Mm -hmm. I'm following. <laughs> Yeah. But then if you want three characters to interact in more of a platonic way, maybe like they're bros, ah. you could then have a bro T3, which is where the portmanteau part comes in. Amazing. So many processes happening to create this one lexical item. It's beautiful. And I love it. And again, really carving out this particular cultural need. And that's part of what makes a successful portmanteau successful. There's some really great work from Constantine Lignos and Hilary Pritchard where they quantified what makes a good blend word, which I thought was really great. Some of those words I chose for you at the start, Gretchen, came from their less successful list. Uh, yeah, I, I thought those were, you know, very unsuccessful words like fossil and brinkles. <laughs> they also had on that list, uh, woe nut. Woe nut. Uh... Oh, wait. Which is not a sad donut. It's, it's a donut full of woe. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sad donut. Okay, no, wait. It's probably like, God, like a waffle donut. Yeah. In the oh. vein of the um, cronut, the croissant donut, there was this, or it still is an ongoing combination of carb-based bakery foods that tend to get portmanteaued. Yeah, okay. I don't know. The cronut is fine, but I, I don't think walnuts are going to be ha happening anytime soon. <laughs> and wegotism. No. <laughs> I love that you refuse to even try and define it for me. You're just like, <laughs> whatever that is, no. I mean, I guess it's from, like, uh, I guess it's from we and egotism, but I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's egotism, but for more than one person. There's nothing like seeing a portmanteau that falls flat to make you appreciate how satisfying a really good one is. Okay, tell, tell me some of the good ones. Please wash my brain out of this. Some of the good ones include mathlete. Ooh, good. Guestimate. Yeah. And mockumentary. All really satisfying in a way that egotism just doesn't do it for me. And that's because you can understand them mm -hmm. and you can figure them out from their constituent parts without needing me to prompt you that we're talking about baked goods or weather. One of the other ones that they pointed out as a, I'll let you guess whether this was a good or a bad example. Okay. <laughs> but I think it'll be pretty obvious was grout fit. A grout fit? Is that when you have an outfit with lots of tiling grout <laughs> holding it together? Well, this is the point they make in the paper is, is it's a green outfit, a gray outfit, a great outfit? No, it's a grout outfit. <laughs> That's the only version that's satisfying. If you had an outfit that was made of grout, that would be a very satisfying blend word. You can dress like that for Halloween. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's low on what they call applicability. It's not very <laughs> applicable to many contexts, except maybe if you're at like a fancy dress party for Tyler's. <laughs> if anyone has any pictures of internet grout fits, uh, we do want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, one of their factors is understandability, which grout fit fails on if it stands for green or gray or great. And another factor is applicability, which grout fit fails on if it stands for grout and outfit. Mm-hmm. And a word has to fit your mouth in a really satisfying way that guesstimate and mockumentary do. The overlap there is so nice and it feels like a real word. Yeah, it's it has this sense of it feels Englishy already. It feels like it's typical of the language and it particularly helps. And I think this is a really interesting factor when it comes to portmanteaus. If the combined words share a syllable or at least a sound. Mm-hmm especially a vowel sound. So like glitterati 
gaydar hacktivism, all really great. Yeah, there's a nice big clear hinge at the two points of the word. Like you have that litter, glitterati, litter, which goes from glitter to literati, and you've got a whole litter for them to overlap at, which is great. Um, whereas something like, what do you think of Lega Sequel? Le- legas- legacy. Uh, legacy is a word and sequel is a word, but there's like too much overlap there for my mouth and brain to cope with. And also they're spelled very differently, like the C in legacy is with C-Y versus S-E for sequel, which makes it oh look gosh, really just, weird on the page. I've just looked at where you've written that down on the page and like I didn't even look at that as an English word. Yeah, it's really bad. Um, yeah. How do you feel about privileviousness? It sounds like a very fancy word and it looks like an absolute car crash written down. <laughs> um, it just doesn't look like the other words that we have in English or gym intimidation. Again, I think uh, with English, it's such a writing based language that for any portmanteau to have legs, it has to be satisfying written down as well as spoken. They also had condisplaining in their list. Okay. Which I will grant written down doesn't look too bad, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. And I think that's because a lot of the time, another thing that blends have going for them is that they're fun. Yeah. It's a fun and playful thing, and condisplaining is not necessarily a thing you'll use in a fun way. Yeah, I mean, like, mansplaining has definitely caught on, but it doesn't have that extra syllable of condisplaining, which really makes the word seem more insufferable. Yeah. But their examples of fun words like Sharknado and Sheeple, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I think portmanteaus are definitely a kind of wordplay. And the more novel but satisfying a portmanteau you can come up with, the better a success that is. I first got introduced to the linguistic analysis of portmanteaus through a paper by a linguist that I knew in grad school named Cara Di Girolamo. Mm-hmm. And she was analyzing specifically fandom pairing names. Right. So this is things like if you have Sherlock Holmes and John Watson and you call them John Locke or something like that. Uh Uh-huh. And she was analyzing, in particular, names from the TV show Glee. Okay. Which was popular at the time. And how the fans talked about various combinations of wanting those characters to get together by combining their names into portmanteaus. Right. A very useful activity for people deep in this particular fandom. Well, and a very useful activity for linguists because you, it's sometimes it's hard to come up with like, okay, we need these two words to combine with each other. And then we also need it to have a plausible meaning (laughs) and so on and so forth. Whereas with the characters, you can just pick sort of any two characters and be like, what if they were a couple? And you can end up with these sort of phonologically implausible combinations because Obviously, the creators of the show weren't thinking, oh, I've got to name my character stuff that will be combined well. And of course, this is why big linguistics bankrolls major (laughs) TV and pop culture so that we can create the conditions in which we can study the ways that people blend character names to create fandom pairings. Absolutely. I wish that was the case. I assume this is how she collected her data. (laughs) I think she may have been hanging out with the fandom, to be fair, at the time. Right. Okay. It was more of a, like, anthropological observation (laughs) thing than, like, billionaire media mogul creates natural experiment thing. You know, please, if there are any billionaire media moguls listening um, (laughs) uh, who wants to fund this research. Have we got some natural experiments for you to run? (laughs) We can connect you with some grad students. Uh (laughs) So she has this really fun case study of the two characters, Rachel Berry and Quinn Fabray who Mm. various members of the fandom wanted to get together. And at first, they made their pairing name Quitchell, which is from Quinn and Rachel. Okay. I I guess it is. Quinn and Rachel. Quitchell? Quitchell. Yeah. Well, so it's sort of fine if you say it out loud, but if you write it down, a lot of people see it and they think quiche, like the food. Oh, quiche. Quiche. Yum? Yum? Yeah, but not exactly like the connotation that they were trying to, 
you know, convey. <laughs> and so the fandom actually decided that Quitchell Kishel was too difficult of a pairing name combination to have. And they held a vote for what should be the replacement name for referring to the combination of these two characters. Very democratic. Yeah. And they ended up with Feberi. Feberi. Which does have this nice, like, B overlap, because remember when, you know, if two words have a sound in common, you can overlap them at that common sound mm -hmm. from Fabre and Barry to Feberi. And so she used this poll to argue for, okay, like, what are the criteria that people are using to figure out whether a combination feels satisfying or not? And one of those is pronunciation, but another one of those is, does the spelling seem to correspond to that using English's notoriously irregular spelling system? And so that stuck, and they stopped being called quiche. Apparently, yeah. So good. No more quiche. The playfulness of blends fits into their origin in a lot of ways. People have been playing around with this way of doing things in English off and on for a long time. As we said, definitely the 20th century was the rise of the portmanteau. But Lewis Carroll is generally credited with making them something quite popular with his 1872 poem, The Jabberwocky. So Jabberwocky starts, "'Twas brillig, and the silty toves did gyre and jimble in the wabe. All mimsy were the borogoves, and the momoraths outgrabe." So this is a poem of sort of mostly nonsense words in between normal English function words like the and and, so you can kind of tell what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. but you don't actually know what a borogove or a wrath or a silthy tove looks like. And some of these words were the combination of two other words. Right. So slilthy is from sly and filthy. Uh, that's interesting because I pronounce it as slithy. Oh, I, I mean, apparently Lewis Carroll wants people to say slithy. Huh. I just looked at it and said slilthy because that's what it looks like to me, which is again an example of how English orthography is not necessarily a guide to how to pr actually pronounce something. And this shows up in portmanteaus a lot. He also really wanted to be gyre and gimbal in the wave, but like I instinctively pronounced that gyre and gimbal. So, you know, this is one of the things that happens with coining a word is you don't necessarily retain control of it. What's really interesting is that some of his portmanteaus from the poem have stuck. So chortle, which is generally considered a blend of chuckle and snort, oh. uh, has become a word that kind of has its own life outside of Jabberwocky, the poem now. And Carol called these words portmanteau words because a portmanteau was at the time a relatively commonly used word in English to refer to like a briefcase or a traveling case or bag for clothes or other necessities. And originally from French, uh, meaning like a coat carrier to carry a coat. And he, the idea was for him that it was two meanings packed up into one word as if you put them in a little suitcase together. It's so funny that we've kept the meaning of the word for words and not for transporting clothing. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of is. And I, I find like the technical linguistic term is blend, which is a sort of very uh, bland choice of like, okay, we've blended these two words together. Portmanteau mm -hmm. is sort of interesting, but also a bit obscure because we don't use that word for suitcases anymore. We could call them suitcase words, I guess, but that also seems a little bit weird. I was devastated to discover that portmanteau is not actually a portmanteau. It's long enough and it has the feeling mm. that it could be a blend of words, but it's just actually a compound in French of like port, carry, and manteau, coat. Disappointingly, not a portmanteau. I love it when words like this for especially sort of silly linguistic phenomena are themselves examples of the type of thing they're trying to describe. Mm -hmm. So like, what if you could make a name for blends or portmanteaus that is itself a combination of two words? Like, I don't know, blurred for blend word? Oh, it's hard when your portmanteau creates a word that is a word already. We have blurred, so that's probably oh, yeah. not. That's true. Or it just sounds terrible, something like wordbination. Mm, wor wor wordbination? Wor 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 mm. Word and combine don't actually have anything in common, and so trying to smush them together is an exercise in failure. It doesn't help that word and blend are both words that are very short. Yeah. What are some other words that are related to words that are longer? I guess if you had like a lot of blends because they create a lot of utility in the way that we speak, you could say that a group of blends is a flexicon. 
Oh, like a flexible lexicon. And it's got this yeah. nice little lex combination there. But I think I'm definitely stretching what could be relative to referencing a portmanteau word. Yeah. And, and a flexicon, it's a satisfying, you know, word as itself, but it doesn't transparently connect to the meaning of a blended word or a smushed together word or a combined word. So yeah, I guess we have to keep calling them portmanteaus and blends because there isn't a better self-defining option, but I wish there was. Do you know another word that's a portmanteau word? In many, but it sounds like you have one in mind. Lingthusiasm. <laughs> oh, hey! <laughs> of course it is. So our podcast, in case you uh, hadn't noticed this from the byline, is a combination of linguistics plus enthusiasm. It's a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. We sure are. I think we did sort of an okay job at coming up with this blend, but I will say it is a little bit hard to pronounce. It definitely writes better than it speaks. Yeah, it writes better. But when I've tried to like be on other podcasts or tell people the podcast, I'm like, ling enthusiasm. And I have to say it very carefully because having like the ng before the th is just sort of a lot. Yeah, that ng is right up the back of your mouth and th is like just tucked in at the teeth there. So you're moving really far through the mouth. And it's, you know, sort of ironic that as a linguistics podcast, we have a name that is linguistically just objectively difficult to say. <laughs> what I enjoy about it, Gretchen, is it lets us see the different ways that people deal with this. So some people hyperarticulate mm. and hit both the ng and the th. Some people just don't even bother sending their tongue all the way back for that ng sound and instead just pronounce it something like lymphusiasm mm. or lymph lymphusiasm. I quite like that. Yeah, or sometimes people sort of introduce like a bit of a K sound or a G sound in between to provide a mm -hmm. transition. The way that sometimes you hear people say hamster as hamster with a P, even though there isn't originally etymologically a P there, but you can sort of produce a P in hamster to help you say it. So you can have like link enthusiasm and give it a bit of a K there. Um, all right, I I'll take it. It's an interesting, fun linguistic experiment that we're doing on everybody. <laughs> And the great thing is that this way that people either create that K by taking the th back a little bit or create a n instead of a ng and bring the tongue forward, this is a very common type of sound change process that creates another kind of smushing. So this is our second kind of linguistic smushing, which is often happening within a word, but sometimes happening between words when they're said very close together mm -hmm. and making the sounds more similar to each other. This is a process known as assimilation, which a very useful does what it says word when it comes to linguistic sound processes. So assimilation as in the sounds become more similar to each other? Yeah, not a great word. Uh, in other contexts. <laughs> no, it has rather unfortunate social implications, doesn't it? Yeah. People assimilation, not great. Sound assimilation. Fine. Super common. Yeah. Very common, really, in, I think, basically all of the languages, at least languages that are actually being used by humans who have bodies in this day and age. We are efficient. Yeah. And, you know, like if you are learning to cook or something and you're like a new cook, you're going to take your knife and chop the carrots in a sort of very slow and awkward and clumsy process. Whereas if you see a video of someone who's like very professional and they're just like Ch -ch 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 -ch, and doing this very efficient, smooth, no wasted movements process for chopping their onions or whatever, that's what you're doing with your tongue when you're making the sounds just a little bit more similar to each other in order to make them a little bit easier to produce. And you get these really interesting consistencies in the way that sounds get smushed together. Because we're working with bodies that have, you know, very similar constraints. One of my favorite examples of linguistic assimilation is what happens with sounds like M and N in some contexts. So let me give you some, some words and tell me what they have in common. Okay. So I have inactive, mm -hmm. inedible. Okay. Imperfect. Okay. Imbalance. Yep. Independent. Right. Instable. Mm. And incurious. So they all start with I. Mm-hmm. And then I want to say 
Like they all have a prefix that means the same thing, like not. You're not edible. You're not stable. You're not cautious. Right. And they're like, they're basically the same prefix. Some are N and some are M. Yeah. So sometimes we write this prefix like im, imperfect, imbalance, immaterial, immovable. There's loads of them. And sometimes we write this prefix in like in inactive and inedible and incautious, infrequent. But we pronounce it slightly differently, especially with that imperfect where it gets an M mm-hmm. versus independent where it gets an N. And this is because of the next sound. So imperfect, we have a P, independent, we have a D, and P like an M is made with the lips, and D like an N is made just behind the teeth. Exactly. In writing, we make this distinction between M, M, and N, but there's actually a few more subtle differences in terms of how the sounds are made between like infrequent, Mm -hmm. which you could say is infrequent. But often people actually move that N a little bit closer and sort of pronounce it with the the teeth on the lips as well as the F. Infrequent. Infrequent. Or invalid. Invalid. Congrats to everyone joining us on public transport or while out for a walk, (laughs) just going frequent. Infrequent. (laughs) Yes, please please make some sounds and make the people next to you uh, look at you a little bit funny. It's fine. Uh, Welcome to the club. Or, you know, make it with your with your mouth and, and don't articulate if you have to. So there's this infrequent and the same thing with something like incautious or incurious, ingracious, where you tend to move the nasal sound, the and to be more of a ng, like in sing, move it back to the same place that you're constricting your tongue as with the k sound ing cautious. It's like ink cautious, ing cautious. Inconceivable. It's so interesting. Some of these turn up in the writing system and some of them don't and completely escape our notice. Right. Yeah. Like the M is right there in writing. And so you have to remember, oh, you have to write it different. But the pronunciation is like right there and straightforward. And then the N in incautious or incurious is not there in the writing, but you know to pronounce it that way because it's just easier to do, even if no one's actually told you. You're like, oh, well, that's easier. And there's a few that are just totally in the writing system. So you also have words like illegible or irreplaceable. Because we've just decided instead of saying inlegible or irreplaceable. Yeah. It's just easier to make that one sound. That's just way too hard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like these words, the in prefix in English goes back to Latin. So you find words like this in a whole bunch of languages that have gotten these words from Latin, because already in Latin, they were like, yeah, you just have to make it more similar. That's what you do. And it's not just in these prefixes that this assimilation happens, because we saw with ling enthusiasm, it's that same kind of thing with the nasal moving to accommodate for the next sound. Or my favorite, which is if you listen to pretty much anyone say the word handbag in rapid speech, a lot of the time it will become handbag. The bag that you keep ham. The place where you store your ham. (laughs) Mm. Mm. Uh, But it's pretty unlikely that you'll be talking about ham storage situations at the same time as you're talking about the purse that you grab every day. And so – we don't actually pay attention to the distinction because we normally don't need to. My favorite example of this is in the word input, mm-hmm. which is not from the kind of in that means not, because it's not the opposite of put. Yeah. Like you can either put something or you can input it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's from the thing that you put in, where this other in means inside of and is not the same thing. But because it's like so hard to say input, most of the time in rapid speech, people are actually saying input. I feel like I often type input. Yeah, me too. And then they underline it in the red squiggles. And I'm like, no, come on. You know what I meant? Like, this is the better way to spell it anyway. (laughs) Yeah. There's a bunch of Latin prefixes that do it like the Latin prefix com, as in with. Uh Uh-huh. So you have like companion. With a M. Someone you break bread with. Compan. So there's the M before the P. Mm -hmm. But collect. That co, the double L, is still a nasal that's just been made to be like the L. Really? I'm so mad right now. (laughs) (laughs) And consume. There it is as an N. Uh Uh-huh. It's not consume. 
because that's too hard to say. And even coordinate before a vowel, you just drop the following nasal entirely in that case. I'm also angry. <laughs> <laughs> They're all the same prefix. Yeah. It just means with. <laughs> right. And same with the Greek prefix, which comes to us via Latin, sin, meaning together. Uh huh. So symphony, where that M becomes like the PH sound, uh-huh. the F, symphony, and syntax. As in? All the same sin. Sin and sim in symphony and syntax are the same. They're all the same sim. Ah, oh, this thing with nasals turns up all over the place, and not just in English and Latin and Greek. Uh, we have links to papers in the show notes to Jakarta, Indonesian, Asibale Afan Oromo, and also Akan, which is a language of Ghana. Uh, there are so many languages where this is a super common process. This is basically if I found a language that had like a nasal and then another consonant, and they didn't assimilate, I'd be sort of surprised at this point. Mm -hmm. It's so common that the phrase homogenic nasal assimilation is just one of those phrases that you pick up and it sticks with you because it turns up again and again. So I like homorganic nasal assimilation because it seems really complicated, but you can break it down etymologically in a way that's really satisfying. So you have home organic, so that's homo prefix meaning same, and then the same organ. Yeah. So it's like the same part of the mouth, whether it's the lips or just behind the teeth or towards the back of the roof of the mouth or various other places, like you want to have the nasal sound be at the same spot in the mouth as the sound that's coming after it. Homogenic nasal assimilation. It's really nice. Very satisfying. Of course, not the only process of assimilation. There are a lot of these processes that happen. They happen with vowels getting more similar to each other. We did a whole episode about the kind of assimilation that happens with C and G before different vowels, like why C mm -hmm. and G seem to come in a hard and soft version, unlike most of the other consonants, uh, because they tend to be affected and made more similar to the next vowel that's coming after them. And rest assured that signers as well as speakers are good at being efficient when it comes to articulation, and you get assimilation in signed languages as well. There's a really interesting video from 1913, which has got to be some of the older videos of signed languages about this signer named George Vaditz in his film called The Preservation of American Sign Language. And it shows him signing the old ASL word, remember? Mm -hmm. And in this video from over 100 years ago, he's signing it starting with an open hand at the forehead, and then the hand would come down and the thumb would touch the top of the other thumb from the non-dominant hand. And now it's just the thumb at the forehead to the thumb touching the other hand. You can see videos of this. We'll link to it in the description. It's such a charming old video. He just has this like oldie timey. The, the footage is old, but he also does this little like head nod did while he's doing it. It's incredibly charming. But as you said, you go from having the open hand to the thumb and now over a century of assimilating the hand shape, people just go from the thumb at the forehead to the thumb down at the other thumb. Yeah, and it's an example of making it more efficient by not changing the movement midway through the sign. And you see a lot of these changes in signed articulation where people will just keep the same hand shape or they won't change location for a sign where the position in the body might have moved in an older version of it uh, to keep things efficient. I think it's neat to look at the sign examples because when we write words down, it's not always clear that like, M and P have this particular relationship of both being produced with the lips. You have to sort of go back and think about that as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And a lot of sounds happen like inside the mouth and we can't really see them very well. Indeed. So you can see the, the signs becoming more similar to each other in a way that's sort of obscured for us by writing systems sometimes. Writing systems are really holding us back when it comes to <laughs> thinking about assimilation. They, they really are. Because they're so conservative. We really lose a lot as written language users when it comes to keeping track with changes that are happening in speech, but don't necessarily reflect well in the writing system. And sometimes we do start writing words in ways that correspond more closely to how they're being spoken. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of words like gonna and have to. Yes. 
which have been respelled from going to and have to. I don't think very many people at all say, I have to go to the store. No. Nope. You might say, I have two donuts, but I have to go to the store. But you definitely can't write gonna or have to in a school essay. No, like they're not part of this formal register, but they're very much part of the sort of texting or social media or informal written register. And there are relatively consistent ways of writing them, even though they're not formalized, like gonna tends to be written with two N's, gotta with two T's, wanna also with two N's. Like they have these consistent ways of spelling them, even though they're part of this informal writing register. And it's interesting to watch this little two here, this function word, which if you say it by itself, you get the full word. Going to. But when it is in these quicker phrases, you can see that it's kind of getting squished into the previous word that sound is being assimilated and that vowel too which is very much at the back of the mouth with the tongue but it gets more and more towards the middle and the lips get less and less rounded as it becomes less articulated uh, yeah it gets it's more and more of like a neutral default uh vowel the schwa vowel which is sort of the least extreme of anything your mouth can be doing it's the most efficient vowel that you just sort of say if you're making a uh like making a grunt sound or a, a, a neutral sound, and it gets made to be the easiest thing to do. Because these words are super high frequency, we're saying them all the time, and you don't really need that added information of what else could it be in that context. So going to becomes gone to becomes <laughs> gonna. And this reduction that constantly goes on is part of how language gets used. It's like a path that we continue to wear down and things become more assimilated through that phonetic process and they start to lose particularly clear meaning. And then you create this ability for the language to generate things that eventually just become part of the grammar or part of a single word through this smushing. It's sort of a trajectory from very concrete words to very abstract grammaticalized words. So from something that means like go as in physically move to a place mm -hmm. versus something that just means a generalized abstract concept of future. So I'm going to the store is physically moving to a place, whereas I'm gonna bake a cake or something is a notion of future that doesn't mean that I'm going to walk to the cake in the same <laughs> way. I love it when you have you eventually get to like it's totally fine to say I am going to come and it's just like if you right. think about them in their semantic sense it's a contradiction but this happens across languages the future is often created in this way if a language didn't have a future tense it will create one through this kind of process or sometimes create like a second bonus extra future <laughs> you can never have too much future uh <laughs> So you get this reduction in the sound, you get this reduction in how much meaning is in a word, and it becomes less concrete and more abstract. Or sort of, yeah, like a reduction in terms of how much concrete meaning, but like an enhancement in terms of the ability to express more abstract concepts. Well, yeah, it becomes a very useful part of something that becomes more grammatical. My favorite example of this process and how cyclic it is, mm -hmm. is the French word Aujourd'hui. Okay. So aujourd'hui in French means today. Great. That's just what it means. And if you look at it and you have a little bit of French, you might say, okay, aujourd'hui. We could break that down. The O means like at the or on the mm -hmm. itself smushing from a le, but we're going to ignore that. <laughs> the jour part means day. Mm -hmm. Great itself also is smushing from something in Latin, but we're also going to ignore that. <laughs> yeah, it's smushing all the way down. It's smushing all the way down. There's really so much smushing smushed into this one word. The D, like the D apostrophe is from D, which is itself, again, you know, sh smushing, um, which means of. <laughs> oh, I'm shocked. And then, so these are fairly well-known French words if you break them down. And then you have this last part, which is spelled H-U-I. Mm -hmm. And it's pronounced we, aujourd'hui. I'm going to guess, Gretchen, that that's been smushed down from something. Oh, Lauren, you're so right. Mm. <laughs> so we, 
which sounds like the French word for yes, but is not, is an obsolete word that also means today, which is what the whole thing means. Amazing. So the word today in French, if you break it down etymologically, means on the day of today. But we don't even need to stop there. Right. Because we comes from Latin hodie. Right. Which is a contraction of hoc die, meaning on this day. On this day. So aujourd'hui, aujourd'hui, is literally on the day of on this day. Amazing. It's got two days in it. <laughs> it's not today. Well, it is today, but it's two T-W-O. It is extremely today. <laughs> It's extremely today. It is extra much today because it's like you had a path that started eroding and so you put some extra paving stones in to like shore it up and added an extra day so you wouldn't get confused about the word we that means yes. It's stories like this and it's the realization that language is constantly doing this that makes me feel really comforted by the kind of processes of use because it's not a wearing out of language it's a right. lovingly using and laying down and you know our portmanteaus today will become concrete words and then they might get eroded down or re-blended or used again to create new what could be grammatical forms and it all just continues on across history and it's easy to see when you look across time how language continues to just get loved and used and worn it's like how we can forget that chortle started off as kind of a joke word from Lewis mm -hmm. Carroll in this poem. And we're like, well, that's just a word that means a thing. It's not a, you know, particularly a portmanteau. It's just a word that I have. And we could then re-portmanteau it into another word and keep doing this process over and over again and like building things up and smushing them together and then building up more stuff and smushing it back together. It's a really exciting process of making stuff. And I like how smushing reminds us of the physicality of language. Hmm, yeah. And how when you say a word that's been smushed, your body, your tongue, your hands are tracing a path that so many other people's bodies have also traced. It's like when you're walking down a set of stone stairs that have this sort of dent in the middle from this very soft groove of everyone's steps in it over centuries. Hmm. And you can feel that you're going where someone else is going. When you're using a smushed word, you're participating in this sort of language pathway that has been part of so many people's bodies for so many generations. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all of the podcast platforms or lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode at lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including the IPA, branching tree diagrams, Booba and Kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our Etymology is and Destiny t-shirts, and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Links to my social media can be found at gretchenmcculloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you want to help keep making the show run ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include secret codes, inner voices, and how we made vowel plots with Dr. Bethany Gardner. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producer is Sarah Dapiarella, our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens, and our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Thank you.